First John 3, Lord, I pray that you uh, bring space to the Holy Spirit and that these words that are spoken will uh, enter all the hearts and uh, embed themselves into them. Okay, First John chapter 3, guys. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that he heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore he slew him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer, murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we that the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay, uh, lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we, then have we confidence uh, toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing to his sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us this commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us, by the Spirit, by the Spirit which he hath given us. Amen. Lord, I pray that you fill Brother uh, Joshua Gander, Gander with your uh, spirit, and that uh, these words flow uh, uh, purely and into the hearts of the people here. And uh, we thank you for your lasting life, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So we're dealing with the second part of 1 John chapter 3 there. <clears throat> Love the brethren. Love the brethren is the title of this message. So this is another message in the book of 1 John, where John refers to it as being a message that is from the beginning. So this is pointing again back all the way to John chapter 1, which points all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Specifically in this context... The Bible refers to the story of Cain and Abel. And if you would, look at verse 11. It says, For this is a message which ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. The story then goes back, all the way back to Cain and Abel, which is in Genesis chapter 4, and you can begin there. And this is specifically referring to Cain, which is the poor example of this. He's of that wicked one, and he slew his brother, the Bible says here. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Keep your finger there in 1 John chapter 3. We're going to go back and learn something from Cain there in Genesis chapter 4. The Bible doesn't lie when it says this is a story which you have heard from the beginning. 
This is a message that you have heard from the beginning. We're way back in Genesis chapter 4. And sin had just entered in in the previous chapter unto mankind. And immediately the message is portrayed that he ought to love one another. And it is not as Cain who is of that wicked one and slew his brother, but rather there's a greater message that we should love one another that's learned through this. Genesis chapter 4, way there at the beginning, says this, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. The Bible in context of 1 John chapter 3 talks about Cain's works being unrighteous and his brothers being righteous. And this was the main area of dispute between the two of them. What works are presented here? Well, if you look in verse 3, you'll see the works of Cain. In the process of time it came to pass, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering of the Lord. That is his works. That is his presentation unto God. Verse 4 says, And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Bible records this, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, which was of the flocks and the fat thereof. And he had not respect unto Cain and his offering, which was of the plants and vegetation and fruits of the ground. The Bible says in verse 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. This is God talking specifically to Cain. If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, well then sin lieth at the door. So doing well, you're accepted. Not doing well, you have now chosen sin which lieth at the door. Now, what makes these works? Well, because what I believe happened here we know that the Bible records that sin is the transgression of the law. So could it be that this law had already been laid down? That the offerings unto God were not to be fruit of the ground, were not to be vegetation and, and that sort of thing, vegetables and fruits, but rather they were indeed to be of the flocks and of the herds? The Bible records that these are both given as offerings, and yet the Lord respected one, and the Bible in 1 John chapter 3 calls these works. The one works were evil and the other works were good. Quite often we use this as an illustration of Cain bringing his own works, which was him tilling the ground. But the Bible records by interpretation of the, Old Test or the New Testament talking back to the Old Testament in exposition, it says that they were both works. Well, why were they both works? Because I believe they were both in commandment or in contradiction to a commandment. I believe that this is actually showing us that the works were unrighteous because the command was not followed, and the works were righteous because the command was followed. And what was the command? That you are to bring to the offering of the Lord of the sheep, of the flock, and of the fat thereof. Just like we see recorded throughout all of the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In other words, an offering cannot just be of some vegetation. It must have the shedding of blood associated with it. Why? Because it's a type, it's a picture of Jesus Christ, who was the Lamb to come, slain from the foundation of the world indeed, and therefore pictured throughout all of history of mankind. So, what does this story, yes, it does show us that there was a command given that was broken. I believe that to be true because of the shedding of light from the New Testament upon the Old. Specifically what we saw in 1 John about the works not being right. 
But what does it teach us about loving our brother? Obviously, it's a very unloving thing to slay your brother, of course. But <clears throat> the statement comes maybe even clearer when we see verse 9 and what it says here. It says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? He asked the Lord, Am I my brother's keeper? Am I to keep my brother? <clears throat> well, the answer is yes. <laughs> he is his brother's keeper. And this is where the truth from 1 John, I believe, comes into fruition. That he was to love his brother. He was to be his brother's keeper. He was to keep his brother. He was to retain, to possess, to honor, to preserve, to guard, to protect, to keep his brother. And when God asked him that question, where is your brother? God knew for well because his brother's blood was already crying up from the ground. But God simply asked that question to prove that truth, that he had already had this conversation with Abel. And they already knew the bond that they had one with another. Why? Because, again, 1 John tells us that this is a message which you have heard from the beginning. Which means not just me hearing it from the first time I read Genesis. I believe Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, had already heard that same message, that you ought to love one another. You ought to love your brother. And so he says, where's your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. You are to love your brother. You're to retain them, possess them, keep them, preserve them, protect them, do good to them. All of those ideas go with the idea of keeping. And this is the poorest of examples that we have, because when it says you're to love your brother, you can go back to 1 John. When he says, you are to love one another, immediately the Bible records in 1 John, not as Cain, here's your bad example, not as Cain are you to love one another. Why? Because he was of that wicked one. It's the poorest example, and he's actually compared to as the world around us. And you'll read that as you go down into verse 13. So the Bible says in verse 12, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. And then it says in verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. So just as Cain hated his brother, because his works were evil, and his brothers were righteous, Marvel not, brethren, if the world hate you, because their works are evil, and your works are righteous. Because of your works, the world is going to hate you. But be of good cheer. Verse 14 says this, We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So we have passed from, we abide not in death because of our love. Because that same envy that was within Cain is not, or rather should not, be a part of the Christian's heart. When you look upon your brother who is doing righteous things, and you look upon his works, do you have that same feeling as Cain, where you are welled up with envy and hate on your brother? That ain't right. But it's something I believe that Christians could fall into. It is an envious heart. And why do we get it most often? Because our own works are unrighteous. We will look on the righteous deeds of our brother and begin to envy them. And that's how that wells up in you. That's how that same feeling builds up within your own heart. It's like this. The same way as the story of Cain and Abel was, there was a direct command given. One chose to obey and one chose to disobey. In the same way in the Christian's life, direct commands are given. One chooses to obey and one chooses to disobey. And that same mentality of Cain, who was of that wicked one, who is that terrible example, can well up in the Christian's heart, who is not doing the works. When they look on their brother and they begin to envy and hate them because they are doing what they know in their hearts they should be. That's where that envious heart comes from. But it should not be among us. We've passed from death unto life, and it's because we love the brethren that we begin to see this happen. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And you don't want to be abiding in death. <clears throat> Verse 14, loveth not equals abiding in death. So those two are synonymous, those two ideas. So, <clears throat> This is another, I believe, and if you read down 
Read verse 14. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And I believe this is another one of those choosing passages. This is another one of those ideas where we need to not get these two ideas mixed up where we're saying, okay, well, that guy hates his brother, so he's automatically not saved. He's abiding in death. He's, he's not saved. Because when we do that, we're negating many scriptures that have Christians behaving in, in ways that are synonymous with the unsaved world. And then we just start pitching everybody as if they are all not saved. Look at this. This is another verse that just as Christ charges the Christian, abide in me and I in thee. That's a command, right? Yes. To abide in Christ. That means we have the choice whether or not we are going to abide in him. And I would say that if you as a Christian are not abiding in Christ, you are probably abiding in death. It's one of the two. Christ is life. He is the light of the world. He is the life of all mankind, right? John chapter 1 records this. So if you are not abiding in the true vine, which is light, which is life, you are choosing to abide in death. And it's no wonder that you hate your brother when you're abiding in death and you see them in light. By contrast, the two are oppositely opposed. This is another one of those passages, I believe, where the Christian needs to look at it and it's talking in harsh words. It's talking to the Christian as if they are as Cain, as if they are of that wicked one, as if they are of the world because they're hating their brother. John isn't holding back here. He's trying to talk to believers as he has been through this whole book and trying to make the point clear that if you are not living right, you are abiding in death and you might as well be of that wicked one. You are of no eternal value to the kingdom of God. You are not benefiting anybody. Your faith is without works, therefore it is dead being alone. It is not doing for your brethren what it should be and therefore it's useless. The Bible says, Re receive not the grace of God in vain. In other words, you receive that grace of God, ye should walk in those truths. You should be doing good works, especially unto your brethren. In verse 15, it says this. He's going to get really hard on the person who is hating their brother. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. There, that's it. He's not saved, right? No, I believe, again, he's just stressing this point. These people aren't necessarily unsaved because we have to remember, again, the context of this book. It's always speaking to brethren. This passage is speaking specifically about his brother. If you hate your brother, the context is that you are kindred. Remember the Bible just said um, in verse 1, it said, Behold what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, because he hath... Uh, that we should be called the sons of God. And there is that brother relationship being established even within this chapter. <clears throat> but this is, again, a very strong rebuke. Hey, you're hating your brother because your works are unrighteous and you're envying his righteous works? You're a murderer. And we know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. That verse 15 is connecting us back to verse 12 when it says, As Cain. Right? We are connecting the dots here. We are pointing the idea of the murderer to the world, to the wicked one, as Cain. <clears throat> to highlight the fact that if you are acting like Cain, you're acting like a child of the devil. And when you're acting like a child of the devil, it is no wonder that you are exhibiting without fault the works of the flesh that are associated with it, being hatred one toward another, hatred towards your brother. Look at these, Galatians chapter five, keep your finger there. I just wanna show you <clears throat> just what our flesh is capable of. Because again, we can say, okay, the, this murderer, of course he's not saved because he hath no eternal life abiding in him. But again, remember, remember the two natures, remember the, the saved, blood-bought, born again, cleansed, revived, alive, inner man, and then the man that that abides in, which is full of flesh, right? Which, which has that flesh that warreth and lusteth against the soul. So Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 highlights what that flesh is capable of, and I believe even with a living, quickening, quickened spirit within it. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these 
adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Speaking of the works of your flesh, and we know that flesh and blood doth not inherit the kingdom of God by default, so therefore those works will not inherit the kingdom of God, because that flesh will be put off before the resurrected spirit of yourself is revived and will inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. This is just bringing me more to that point that when we read the passage in 1 John chapter 3, again, it's talking to Christians in a very firm and forward type of language whereby John isn't giving any wiggle room to the Christian believer that hates his brother. Especially in this context, the Christian believer that hates his brother because he is envious of the greater works that he is doing than these. Comparing yourselves amongst yourselves, you're not wise. The Bible records this. We need to understand that while some people may be doing greater works than us, that should not be motivation for us to envy them, which will make us into a hateful person towards them. That should motivate us to bring ourselves up to their same level or to recognize that, hey, not everybody is currently all at the same level and just have grace with even ourselves as we grow in Christ. Amen. This mentality can destroy a Christian, especially a newborn babe in Christ who looks at other people and thinks, oh man, they're doing all these great works, they're doing all these great things. And they're either going to get defeated by looking at their brother and not comparing up to his level. Again, comparing yourselves amongst yourselves, you're not wise. Or they're going to get that other effect where they look at them and they envy them and they hate them and they... And they are of that wicked one behaving as if they are because they are just like Cain. They're acting just like Cain. So we see then that a believer can act in all these works of the flesh. Murder was mentioned in that. We see that a believer can act in the works of the flesh. Hatred was one of those. Variance was one of those. There's all these works of the flesh that go along with that same idea of hating your fellow believer. But the contrast is this. We are commanded to love one another. And this is how the world and our brethren perceive who we are in Christ. Look at verse 16. It says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Remember, <clears throat> we learned earlier about uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 when it said, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hereby perceive we the love of God. This is, goes under the same vein. It says, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. In that same way, verse 17 says, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And I remember we've talked about before that the love of God in him is simply the exhibition of God's almighty, all-powerful love just flowing through a believer. That same compassion as God's heart yokes with my heart and is able to go forth and love other people. But I said God's love was commended or proved because he laid down his life for us. Look, the love of us should be perceived in that same way as we lay down our lives for others. The Bible says this, Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's John 5.13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That is the ultimate exhibition of, of love that a man can show for another man is to lay down his life for them. And God did that, only he did even better. He laid down his life not for his friends, but for his folks, for his enemies. God laid down his life for those that hated him in order that he might save them. God's not asking the Christian to lay down their lives 
for those that hate him. That's how he exhibited his love to the whole world. But he's charging that we lay down our lives for our brethren. And the specific example that he gives here is, Whoso hath this world's good and withholdeth it, or shutteth up his bowels of compassion, his heart of compassion towards his brother who has a need that is associated with the world. In other words, money, food, shelter, just those basic generic needs that anyone would have. If he was to do that, well then how dwelleth the love of God in this man? This is what is perceived. In other words, the Christian who has the ability to help the other Christian, when he doesn't, there is no perception of the love of God in him. No one is going to look at him and go, yeah, that's a great Christian man. In other words, the world is not seeing the surrounding people around the situation. The brother himself is not seeing the love of God in him. This man is no better than Cain, who is of that wicked one, who was a murderer. God wants us, rather, to love one another. We cannot compare to the love of God who laid down his life for his enemies. And God's not asking us to. He's asking us to do something even easier, which is simply laying down our lives for our brothers. Doing all we can to pick them up, to help them, to, to lift them up, to encourage them, to strengthen them in their time of need. That's what we are to do as Christians. We will never compare to the great love wherewith God hath loved us. Like it said in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, right there in the beginning of this chapter, in verse 1. What manner of love hath the Father bestowed that we should become the sons of God? We can't compare to that kind of great love. That, that is far reaching that a man could ever obtain to that kind of love. But that love of God does dwell in us through the Spirit of God which is given unto us, and thereby, thereby a measure of that should be able to be dispersed within the confines of what the Scriptures asks for us, and the confines of the Scriptures asks us to simply bless your brother, help your brother, strengthen your brother, lift them up in any way possible. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This is the charge to Christians. Love in deed and in truth. Don't just say it, show it. Don't just say, I love you, man. I've been praying for you, bro. Show it. Give. Help, hug if appropriate, nurture, surprise, care for, encourage, pray for. Not just in word, but, but in deed and in truth. Do unto your brother as you would have done unto you. Love in deed and in truth. Exhibit that love of God, which is in you, believer, to the utmost of your ability, to the best of your capability. Love your brother. It's, it's, it should be natural. But for some of us, sadly, we've let roots of bitterness grow up in us, and it's not so natural anymore. But let's get back to that. Let's get back to that love. Let's get back to what God commands of it. And the only way we can do it is through the power of God Almighty himself, because it's his love to begin with we're simply imparting unto others. Verse 19. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. We can know that we are of the truth. We can know that we, ourselves, are of the truth, assuring our hearts before God because we naturally love the brethren. Now, have you ever been in the situation where you have met a believer for the first time and you first realize that you're actually both saved? And immediately you're connected one to another. You're close one with another. You talk about things as if you've known each other for years. That is the assurance in your heart, that is the knowledge that you are of the truth that this Bible verse is talking about. You can know that your heart is assured before God because you have that immediate love bond with the brethren. I'm sure we've all experienced that at one time or another. The reason why we are bonded in that fashion is the same way that siblings are bonded in that same fashion. It's because they have the same father because they're related, because there is something conjoining them which they can never change. They have the same root. They, have, they are of the same offspring. And that is the reason, that is the testimony into our own hearts. Now, 
that is just one of the, let's say, spiritual or physical realities that we can perceive that we are of the truth and our hearts can be assured before him. Verse 20 says this, <clears throat> if our heart condemn us, because this, this happens sometimes, right? Because our heart isn't always telling us the right things, right? So we shouldn't base everything on, on like what I just said. Just because I get along with a Christian right away, I'm just assuring my heart. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible records this. So we can't just always trust those things. Ultimately, your real assurance of salvation comes from what do you believe about the scriptures? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation? Do you believe that you have to earn salvation? Do you believe that once you're saved, you are saved forever. If you believe on Christ and Christ alone for your salvation, that is your hope of glory. That is your firm foundation, which you Amen. put your trust of your salvation upon. Because your heart is deceitful above all things. But the Bible does record this, that we can know that we are of the truth and our hearts be assured before him if we do have that bond with the brethren, if we do have that love for the brethren. But, for if our heart condemn us, verse 20, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And this is the only time that that the Bible records this, where, where it says, you know, your heart will deceive you, but God knoweth all things. In other words, he's in control of things that are far beyond what your fleshly feeling or heart would desire or know even of itself. Verse 21, beloved, if our heart condemneth not, then we have confidence toward God. So what this is basically saying is we need to bypass that heart feeling in order to have confidence with God. So yes, that will give you an inner testimony of your love for God and your relationship with God if you have love for the brethren, but bypass that. Understand that your heart will condemn you, but God is greater than your heart and your great confidence before God should not come from that feeling that you have for the brethren, but it should be through faith in Him, and that should always overcome. That should always be far surpassing any kind of feeling that you would have one for another. But this does not negate the truth that's being preached here. The truth that's being preached is we need to have love for another, and it takes it as far as to say that if you don't, you're of Cain, you're of that wicked one, you're in bondage unto the world, you are a murderer at least acting like it as a Christian. And then it says this, that there is an emotional, a feeling, there is a bond, a knit that should be natural within the believer in order to have them yoked with the believer. But greater than all of these is the love of God and the truth which he displays through his scriptures. And that is where you need to have confidence. What I believe this is saying is that you're not always going to feel in love with your brother. You're not always going to feel like they've treated you right, like they've treated you good. Think about Jesus. He came into his own and his own received him not. He came into his own with great love and compassion for them, and they stomped on him. They drug him through the mud. They beat him. They whipped him. They scourged him. Threw him on a cross and let him hung there, hang there until he died. You are not always going to feel this great love for them, but your confidence towards God will allow you to exhibit that love toward them. The Apostle Paul said this, he said, the greater I am loved, the less I be loved. In other words, the greater Paul got into his ministry where he was just closer with God and was bursting at the seams with love for the care of the many churches with he, which he had over all of Asia, the greater that his love was for them, the less he was loved. In other words, he was decreasing as Christ was increasing. He was constantly being put down, mocked, ridiculed, just just treated as the offscouring of the world. And though his heart was bursting out with love for his brethren, the love of God living in him and going through him, he was not always in that situation where he had that great love for them, but he displayed it. And because he was able to display that, it was proof. It was, it was the testimony. It was the perception that others would see when they looked at him and they would say, he has great love for God. He is of God. And you see how that perception of him would be depicted by how he behaved towards his brother. And that was the tell. It wasn't a proof of the Apostle Paul's salvation. He didn't look at his love towards the Christian as a proof of his salvation. Though that love did testify of the love of God which is in him, that came from God himself to have love for these. He simply exhibited what was naturally in him 
and it was seen by others. The Apostle Paul stood firm on the Word of God and the truth of the Scriptures, and yet he still was able to behave himself in that fashion. And he did that by choice. Verse 22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So the confidence that you have that you are believing on God, you are not succumbing simply just to a feeling that's in your heart, but you have confidence towards God, is that confidence will carry out through the rest of your walk. The Bible says here is, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are well-pleasing in his sight. So that confidence will bring confidence into your ministry, into your prayer, into your soul winning, into your study, into your sanctification, and yes, even into the keeping of God's commandments within this context. Because your confidence is not based upon your feelings and how you perceive others in the Christian realm, because your love is simply the offshoot of the love of God which dwelleth in you and is coming forth because God so loved the world, Josh can so love the world, then your confidence in that truth will transform into the rest of the areas of your life. And you will find more growth and more strength and more promise in the areas of keeping his commandments. And what is another one of his commandments, right, we find in this passage? Loving your brother. This is just one of many areas where the Christian, again, will show forth a perception that he is in Christ, that he is loving the brethren, that he is of God, that he is called the sons of God. And it's not just in word, but it's in deed and in truth. And that is the ultimate goal of every Christian, that they are walking in deed and in truth, doing those things that are well-pleasing in his sight. Verse 24, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. And this is how it all rounds itself out into the fullness of the teaching that's being explained here, is that it's not just an act, it's not just a deed, but it's the fulfillment of the keeping of, of what the Spirit of God teaches us. Essentially, when you're saved, that Spirit comes in you. That's the love of God dwelling in you. That's the love that's going to be an offshoot into your ministry, your prayer, your soul winning, your study. The, every aspect of your entire life is going to come through the fact that the Spirit resides in you. And because that spirit, spirit dwelleth in you, because you know that you are saved, because that Spirit dwelleth in you, now you are in the prime position, you are in a perfect position to love the brethren, to keep all the other commandments such as they be given to you. And that again is not going to have anything to do with your salvation. Again, don't get hung up on the fact that this portion of scripture is very firm comparing the person that doesn't love his brother to that of a murderer. We're not saying that that person is now not saved because if they've testified of the truth, then they're saved. They're born again, right? Their firm foundation is what they believe about the scriptures. What we are saying is that their heart could be condemning them. We are recognizing that their heart has condemned them to a point where they're acting just as if they're of the world, just as that wicked one. They're acting just like the world around them as murderers indeed. And it should not be. Why? Because that spirit dwelleth in you. And though the flesh and the spirit are constantly warring against each other, Christians, you have to choose. You have to choose to abide in the spirit or you have to choose to abide in the flesh. And the Bible says here, he that keepeth commandments dwelleth in him and he in him and hereby know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Let your faith and your trust and your actions and your deeds be be planted on the foundation of the fact that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Use the Spirit of God. Use the power that He has given you to do good works, to do mighty deeds, to do great acts. Sometimes that's so much as loving a brother. Sometimes that's so much as getting some sin out of your life. But when you have the foundation that you're not just doing acts out of word or because your heart tells you to do something or because some part of your flesh thinks that that would be better for you, you're going to fall on that foundation. What we need to do is have confidence in God, and the confidence of God will allow us 
to love the brethren and allow us to do all sorts of commandments that God has commanded us. And we'll do it with a new sense of zeal and a new life that goes far beyond what we could ever muster in and of our own spirit and our own flesh.